Okay, um, how does it work? Well, it works because of uh, a group of compounds which loosely we'll call plant growth regulators. Uh, in, in pasture and cereal, the beneficial uh, effects uh, are mainly uh, a result of the increased root exude. So you put the seaweed on the pasture and the plant produ naturally produces root exude. With seaweed it produces more. That goes into the area around the root, the rhizosphere, and it feeds the bacteria in there. The bacteria break nutrients that are locked up in the soil and make them available to the plant. Um, <clears throat> And it can be dramatic if you've got these uh, mycorrhizal fungi in the thing. Uh, in pasture and cereal production, typical increase in, um, in yield of dry matter or, or um, cereal is, is somewhere in the order of 10 to 15 percent. Um, one thing we know about these we're not sure which plant growth regulators are responsible for this in the seaweed. Um, there are two schools of thought. Uh, but we are sure that they seem to work better if there's a reasonable level of nutrition in the plant. So if the plant is reasonably healthy and there's a reasonable level of nutrition in the plant, you get a, a better result than if it's really struggling. And uh, that's the basis of a number of our products where we've got very small amounts of nutrients, added nutrients, like NPK and trace element, that are in the, uh, in the sea that we add to the seaweed. They increase the, um, the quality of the root exudate, which is mainly sugars made from photosynthesis. That feeds the bacteria, and the bacteria need micronutrients and NP and K. So if you combine the two, you get more than uh, the added effect of both of them. So you put in a little extra and you get a lot extra. There are a number of plant growth regulators and I've used the word plant growth regulators in a fairly general way. Uh, there are groups that are called auxins. They call elongation of the cell. They're particularly important for root development. There are betanes, they cause um, changes in the cell turgidity and uh, they regulate the flow of, of um, water in and out of the cell. And they're compatible solids, so I might mention a little bit about compatible solids later. Cytokinins, historically people thought that cytokinins were a major contributor to the efficacy of seaweed. And, recent thought is that's not the case. There used to be a test of bioassay for cytokine, which betanes also gave the same result. And what people, in the, particularly in the Department of Ag in, um, in Victoria, thought were cytokine and effect are almost certainly betane effect. So one of the first analytical job I had with seaweeds was to look for cytokinins. Um, and it soon became apparent that I had my work cut out because there was, in Australia, there was no equipment that could detect so low a level. And about 10 years after I started, a group in Canberra and a group in New Zealand actually detected them. So cytokinins, they are important, but they're not as important as, um, as we thought um, in the 70s and 80s. There are a group of compounds which are called phenolics, uh, and, and sterols, uh, they've got numerous functions in the control of the reactions, with the chemical reactions within the cell. There are a group of um, compounds which I've lumped together as antioxidant. They react with uh, ha harmful oxygen radicals. Um, and then there are, most important, are a group of things which I've lumped together as trigger compounds. These are generally very simple, not always, but very usually very simple compact, which trigger a reaction <coughs> for the gene to, exp to give an expression. So in the case of frost protection, uh, 
there are small amount, we believe a lot of the effect is because there are small amounts which basically tell the plant that it's, it's going to be cold and it should, uh, the, the gene reaction, which if you take, take plants in winter, uh, say wheat, for example, that's a typical case, it can stand minus 10 when it's very small. But when you come to uh, near harvest, a frost of, of minus a, a degree will wipe it out. And that's all um, controlled by the gene. What you can do with these trigger compounds, you can basically switch that gene on and off. So it enables you to get frost protection for, say, wheat um, by spraying the seaweed on there. It dissipates over time and you lose that effect. So the gene's not switched on permanently, but it is switched on. If you gradually took the um, wheat and gradually cooled it over a long period of, day, of days, then it would naturally, that gene would get switched on and it would behave as it does in winter. But of course it wouldn't grow. So there are these compounds which are trigger um, compound and they're extremely important, and particularly in the last decade or so, the importance of these have been... Uh, and ironically, it's come... A lot of our understanding is because people have tried to genetically modify plants, which has put genes that don't occur naturally into the plant, to give that plant a characteristic. And in many cases, not all cases, but many cases, they've been an absolute disaster because in, take the case of wheat, the wheat thinks it's winter so it doesn't grow. So you don't get the yield at harvest. So if you, if you put the gene in there and it's always expressed, you don't get the desired result because it never gets past that stage of growth. Whereas if you switch it on by applying the seaweed, it dissipates and then it gets switched off and the plant grows normally. So seaweed tends to slightly to delay the, um, the, the, the growth of the plant. But we're talking a, a few days, not, uh, not weeks or... Uh, so it's an, a way of using the natural genes that are in the plant and switching them on and off uh, by a chemical trigger. And some of those compounds occur in liquid seaweed. You can make some of those compounds uh, synthetically and get the same effect. All right, um, I've talked a little bit, a bit about uh, the root exudate. Um, we'll, we'll skip that one. Uh, sorry. As, sorry. Uh, chlorophyll production. Um, the effect of liquid seaweed can be mimicked in terms of chlorophyll uh, production by synthetic betanes. Uh, and chlorophyll is produced in the cytoplasm of the plant um, and it appears that betaines, uh, they act as compatible solutes. Put simply, the compatible solutes are things which affect some of the physical properties of the cell but don't uh, unduly influence the chemical reactions. That it's, there's, um, there are a number of compatible solutes and betaines would be a, a typical case. And well, that's how we think it increases chlorophyll content. Can we, the next one? Frost protection, I've talked a little bit about that. We sell a lot of frost guard particularly to commercial growers um, for fruit trees, mainly for fruit trees. It gives uh, two to three degrees extra frost tolerance for the common fruits like um, apples, pears, stone fruit. Um, a little less for grapes, but somewhere around the two degrees extra frost tolerant. Um, and you put it on because what happens is it fades uh, over time, so you've got to put it on regularly about every 10 days. Um, we also put a high level of potassium in because potassium will stop frost damage but it's a very short-lived time. Um, uh, something like 
48 hours, and then it dissipates through the plant. Uh, but we put the high potassium in because people, they ring us up in the morning and say, we're going to have a frost tonight. Can you send us some frost guard? Um, well, the answer is we can, but it will be too late. But if, if you order, if you're going to have it in two or three days, fine, we'll get it on to you. We sell a lot of frost guard. It's sold, uh, we sell it to an, uh, another company that sell it under their label. Uh, and they export it to, um, to the States and New Zealand as well. What, what about peach trees? I mean, peach summer. trees? Yeah, peach trees. Yeah, yeah. 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 So stone fruit, um, apples and pears, and grapes is, is not so successful on grapes. It works on um, wheat and canola. Um, canola is a complicated thing because the frost danger period for canola, it flowers a long time and that's the frost danger period. For wheat, um, it's, if you apply it just at the right time, uh, yeah, you can, you can get about four degrees extra frost tolerance uh, for wheat. So it's very significant, but the problem is wheat farmers, if you've got uh, 10,000 acres and you know it's going to be frosty at the end of the week, you've got your work cut <laughs> out. And the margins, like it always amazes me, um, wheat farmers, that they ever uh, ever make too much money. If they, if, they, if they have a good season, they make money, but most seasons are so-so. Is it affecting the heat stress? It yeah, it, it is. Um, we haven't we haven't done very much work on it. Uh, the people that we've um, worked with and, and discussed things with in the UK, um, they haven't done very much work on heat stress. We know that, you know, people, uh, farmers tell us, yeah, it works, uh, we get the effect, and we would expect it to work for heat stress, but we really haven't done uh, um, any yeah, what I'd call hard scientific work on it. Whereas with the frost, uh, we've done a, quite a few field trials and uh, the people in the UK have done a lot of very, um, very nice scientific uh, work on it. I've tried to get GRDC to, um, because frost in uh, broad acre crops is a major problem. They spend they, over the last decade, they spent over a million dollars each year trying to minimise the damage from frost. Last year was the worst frost damage that they'd had for the last eight years. So they're not really very successful. And uh, what I'm, I say, what you've got to do is get the science right and then the application. You don't try to prove that it works in the field and then try to work back from towards the science. That's not the way to do scientific research. But um, that's how government works and uh, it's a problem. We do have people who are, have been trying it on wheat this year. Uh, the problem in doing trials on frost damage, doing field trials, is A, you can't guarantee that you'll get a frost. B, you can't guarantee it'll come at the right time. And C, you can't I guarantee that it won't be minus five and everything's lost. So it's difficult to do it. Whereas in the lab you can, um, the people in the UK can alter the temperature to about uh, a, le less than a half, of a, a two hundredth of a degree. Uh, so they can do it exactly. And what I've always said is we need to do the science first and then apply it rather than try this and see if we can work out what happened. Anyway, that's, uh, we won't talk about that or I'll we'll be here all night. These are some of our, our products. Um, the dried things, we do, do granules, which is like cornflake size, meal. Um, we, the, the first gold is made from the stems of bull kelp, it's alkaline, super fine is acidic. It's made from the fronds, the leaves. Uh, premium has got added MPK and trace element. Spurred has got this, a similar thing, but a higher level of nitrogen. Frost guard is seaweed plus a high potassium thing. Then we do high potassium blends for people like herb growers. Um, 
and a, a number of other things. We've got a, um, a range of organic, and then we've got one which is sort of um, basically old technology, um, which are the ones tend to, that tend to be used in the home garden, where the, they're fairly coarse, they won't go through a boom spray. Farmers aren't really interested in them, but home gardeners, if they put it on with a watering can, it doesn't make too much difference. 